so much for having me back. I think masks were a major important intervention in preventing spread, and we've seen it has been a really important component of the public health response to preventing transmission and infections. And I'm actually really pleased to be back to be able to speak about vaccines because I think they are imminent and they are certainly going to be a major, um, a major intervention in prevent, as I hope to show you, uh, in preventing and uh, the, uh, the further. Sorry, can you hear me? I think you. Okay, you. I'm good. Uh, sorry, I think there's someone who's. Um, his microphone is on. Um, would you mind muting yourself? Because it's I'm getting background noise. Okay. Thank you very much. So, um, uh, uh, as I was saying, I think vaccines are going to be a key intervention in terms of um, of of uh, uh, preventing uh, further infection, disease, and actually ultimately getting the pandemic under control. So, let me. Um, give you an overview of what I hope to, to cover today. I'm going to give you some context as to where we are in terms of COVID in South Africa. I'm going to briefly discuss some of the biology of the virus as it pertains to understanding vaccines and vaccine efficacy. I'll give an overview of the types of vaccines and how they work, something brief on immune responses to vaccination. And then crucially, I'm going to ask how effective are the current vaccines that we have and what is the impact of their efficacy um, due to variant viral strains, side effects of vaccination, and perhaps I can leave you with some uh, messages about why one would consider to get vaccinated. Okay, so this is a snapshot of where we are. Uh, Heather, if I can just interrupt you, you can just move your laptop just away from the camera because what we've seen now is mostly that, so thanks a lot. Thanks. Sorry, thank you very much. I didn't see the video, so, so yeah, thank you. I can your, switch off. Your face is not central in the picture, so there you go. That, that would be central. Thanks. Right, thank you. Um, okay, so this is a snapshot of COVID in South Africa uh, as of yesterday. Um, uh, around uh, almost one and a half million cases in South Africa, uh, uh, close to uh, approaching uh, 47,000 deaths that we know of. Um, it's pro we know this is an underestimate. And then the clear two peaks, the first peak um, and then the second peak that we've just experienced, and you'll notice the second peak higher numbers, um, but quite a rapid decline, and uh, this predominantly over the December, uh, January holidays. So we've seen, and, and all of us are aware, major amount of illness, of infection. Everyone, I'm sure, has, has, has some loss, um, has had some pain or suffering from the epidemic in South Africa. Um, and I, I, I think the impact on all of us in different ways has been enormous. Importantly, uh, to state that the median age of people in South Africa's second pandemic is 40 years. And while we think we're doing really well, um, sorry, is that okay? Yeah, Mort that's fine. Mortality rate in South Africa, in fact, is amongst the highest in the world. And this is from uh, uh, the John Hopkins site again, and you'll see South Africa. Um, fourth or fifth in terms of mortality rate, um, almost 3% mortality rate um, for COVID. So this is mortality expressed as a proportion of people who are infected um, uh, compared to the overall um, global mortality rate of, of just under 2.5%. We also know that COVID causes not only acute illness, but this, this entity of long COVID, of chronic symptoms is increasingly emerging, so chronic morbidity. And of course, um, uh, what's very, very important in South Africa is the emergence of this new viral variant called 510Y.V2. Um, and, and this, to all extents and purposes, has really um, driving our epidemic currently. And this is from the NIRCD site, and you see the cumulative number of cases um, through the first and second pandemics. Um, and you can see uh, this, uh, the uh, um, blue is in the public sector and uh, uh, sorry, the, per, the, the green is public sector and the blue is private sector um, cases. Now, this um, variant that uh, has really hit the news is dominating. And this, for example, shows the pattern in Kharate from August 
December, and the variant is um, color coded in purple. And so you can just see that by December, this variant predominates. Um, and it's exactly the same for the Western Cape. In fact, uh, we preceded this. Um, so to all extents and purposes, anyone who has COVID should be considered to have COVID from the variant strain. So how protected are we currently in terms of natural infection? And I'll just show you this one study. And this is a study we did at Red Cross Children's Hospital of all healthcare workers who volunteered to be in the study. This is healthcare workers across the board from cleaners to porters to nurses, doctors, and so on. And this study was done during the first wave and uh, was part of a multi-center study done in UK and European countries. And you'll see the prevalence, and this is antibody prevalence, so it's the prevalence of antibodies to the virus was only 10% in South Africa. Um, but then the prevalence in the UK was also only around 15%. And we repeated the study three months later and found very similar prevalence. So I think the message here is that while we think there has been an enormous amount of infection in, in healthcare workers, in fact, the seroprevalence data, well, certainly from Red Cross, do not support this and would suggest that many healthcare workers are, are still extremely vulnerable to infection. And the whole question of whether infection with the wild type virus is protected against the variant strains is something that I'll also address um, a little bit later uh, in the presentation. So let's turn to the virus and just a few words about the biology um, to, to really understand the targets of vaccines. And here's, as, you, as you know, it's an RNA virus and it has these uh, pink spikes, uh, glycoprotein spikes. And, um, and inside uh, the virus, it's got uh, uh, um, genetic material that codes for the various aspects of this virus. And there you see the, the gene for this, for this particular spike protein. Um, the other proteins that are spoken about are the, um, uh, the N protein and the, uh, N, the RNA protein, and those are inside the virus. Um, and, and perhaps better illustrated here, uh, again, the spike protein, the nuclear protein, which is the N protein, um, and then other proteins. And, and this spike protein is really the target or is, is, is what most vaccines um, are, 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 are around. And it's a trimeric um, uh, a glycoprotein. And importantly, it has this area here called the receptor binding domain. And this binds, shown here, to a two receptors actually shown there in this cartoon. You can see how beautifully um, this is shown, spike protein binding to ACE2 receptors. Now, why am I showing you all of this? Because the mutant strains that are emerged in, and the one that has emerged in South Africa have mutations in this receptor binding domain. And so this influences their ability to attach to ACE2 receptors. And as you may know, this mutant virus is much more transmissible, about 50% more transmissible than, than the, um, uh, the usual virus. Um, so it's, the virus has adapted to better bind. Um, and and with this change, there's the question of whether antibodies produced to, to vaccines will in fact be effective if you get changing in this receptor binding domain. So where are we with vaccine development? And this is from a few days ago. Um, amazing work in a very short time, 67 different vaccines in clinical trials, 20 in the final stages of development. And I just want to uh, uh, define these terms a little bit in case, um, uh, forgive me if, you, if, if everyone knows this, but these are important in terms of interpreting the information that is coming out of vaccine trials. So phase one is generally small studies, dozens of people, and they're primarily to assess how safe the vaccine is. Phase two are bigger studies, involve hundreds of people. They uh, typically assess safety, different doses and immune responses. And phase three, which are the really large studies of thousands of people are the studies that, uh, uh, that give us information on how effective it, the efficacy and safety of, of these vaccines. 
So there are currently four different groups of, of vaccines that are produced. Um, the first is messenger RNA vaccines, and these are the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine. And what this is, is really messenger RNA that codes for the virus spoke, spike protein um, inside a nanoparticle. So these are, here you see the messenger RNA inside um, a, a, a tiny little um, uh, lipid particle. Um, uh, um, and this is given obviously by intramuscular injection, the, um, and then is taken up by the person's cells. And this messenger RNA then um, tells that person to then produce spike protein on their cells. And, as a, and following that, the person then produces antibodies to spike protein. Now, importantly to state this messenger RNA is very short lived. Uh, it's, 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 it's only lasts a few days. It's rapidly shredded, almost like a Snapchat kind of message. So it's a message to the body that tells the body to produce, anti, uh, to produce spike protein and antibodies to spike protein that is rapidly shredded. Um, this is uh, fairly unstable and that's why these vaccines need freezers. And I'll come to that later. Then there are adenovirus vectored vaccines, and these use attenuated adenoviruses, which people will know adenovirus typically causes colds, mild upper respiratory tract infections. And this is inside uh, an attenuated adenovirus, the, um, uh, the genetic uh, material that instructs the body again to produce spike protein and then followed by antibodies to spike protein is contained. And this is the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine or Covishield, it's the J&J &J vaccine. And the Russian vaccine also uses adenovirus vectored um, doses. Importantly to state, to notice that almost all of these vaccines require two doses, except for J&J, &J, and I'll come to that. And the Russians have actually used an ingenious, I think, uh, uh, um, strategy where the first dose is adenovirus 26, and the second dose is a different adenovirus 5. And this is, uh, this is to prevent um, one's body from recognizing adeno 26 and not reacting to it the second time. Uh, the viruses, the adenoviruses can bind um, again to largely to muscle cells in one's body, but they cannot replicate and they, they, they do not cause disease. Then there are protein vaccines, and this is the Novavax um, uh, vaccine, and this is actually the pro, uh, protein, uh, spike protein um, inside a nanoparticle. And then lastly, the fourth um, uh, uh, way of um, producing vaccines is to use attenuated or inactivated SARS-CoV-2 virus and uh, coronavirus. And this is what the Chinese Sinovac or Sinopharm have used. Um, we haven't seen published data from this. I'm not going to say too much, except to say that in the Brazilian trial, the, um, the headlines were that this only provides 52% efficacy. So these are the vaccines that I'm really going to speak to today. Um, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, those in bold red are those for which there's good published data. You can see phase three trials and phase two and approved in several countries. This uh, Gamalea, which is a Sputnik um, uh, um, vaccine that I told you used two different adenoviruses, phase three results um, published. The Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, um, I'll go through quite a lot of the data on this because this has hit the headlines yesterday in South Africa. Uh, and then these two vaccines, which you can see I've got marked with dashed red uh, borders because we do not have published data from the phase three um, studies yet. We only have headline press announcements. And this is for the Johnson & Johnson and the Novavax vaccine, but I'll show you what we have. Okay, so a little bit more about the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, as I said, it's double-stranded DNA that encodes for the spike protein of the virus inside this adenovector. And the adenovirus that is used is a modified chimpanzee adenovirus, which as I said, enters the cells but can't re replicate. The dosing regime in the studies um, have been two doses four weeks apart, but I'll show you that this is variable and, um, and this requires a fridge. The J&J &J vaccine is similarly uh, a double-stranded DNA inside an adenovirus, 
uh, uh, here are the adenovirus vectors AD26. This has got a long history of testing for vaccines against Ebola, RSV, Zika, and HIV platforms. Um, and, and so people ask, you know, how come less than 11 months into the pandemic, we actually have vaccines? And it is an extraordinary feat of science, but to say that a lot of the science has built on decades of work um, like this kind of work. Um, and so it's the concerted efforts of, of many groups around the world doing incredible work to, to rapidly develop and test uh, vaccines with phase one, two, and three studies actually in parallel, but it's also the preceding decades of research that, that have enabled this. And this also requires a fridge. Now, a little bit about the immune response, because this is important in terms of understanding whether vaccines, in fact, will be protective against uh, mutant strains. And as you know, there are two arms of defense. There are antibodies that are produced. And as I said, the target here is to produce antibodies to spike protein. And then there are also T cells that are activated that are actually responsible for killing virus inside cells. And I just want to show you, and this is, for example, this is the Moderna vaccine, an mRNA vaccine, you could see the similar data for Pfizer, is that vaccines produce result in both responses. So here, um, this is the antibody responses um, at two different doses of the vaccine. And you can see from uh, baseline uh, to subsequent days um, after vaccination, big increases in antibody responses. But uh, also, you can see here um, uh, from baseline over here, um, actually big increases in different um, uh, TH, TH1 responses. So for example, for interferon production, for interleukin-2, for TNF-alpha, all of these go up um, and they actually go up very quickly um, in, in, uh, in um, vaccinated people, both in uh, young people um, or younger people and in the in elderly people. So I think the bottom line here is these these mRNA vaccines are highly immunogenic, uh, both in terms of their Th1 response and their antibody response. Uh, similarly for the AstraZeneca vaccine, and here you see um, uh, antibody responses since vaccination. Um, and you can see uh, over here, uh, uh, this is uh, antibody responses. This is day 28 of vaccine, after vaccination, 35 and 42. You see an increase in antibody titers. And in, in green here is shown the antibody titers of people who've had COVID. And so you can see this vaccine achieves, oops, sorry, comparable um, comparable um, antibody levels at day 42, or actually from day 35 to those who've been had natural uh, disease. I should have said in the prior slide, in fact, the mRNA um, vaccines achieve higher antibody levels than those who've previously had disease. And, and similarly, you see here um, increases in um, interferon response, which uh, reflects the t uh, t um, uh, uh, th1 response. Um, uh, at different, um, different um, days after vaccination there um, for, the, um, for the Oxford vaccine. A critical question though is how long does immunity last? And actually I think um, there's good news on this. So, so from David Goldblatt's uh, group in the UK, um, in fact, um, uh, antibodies, well, certainly antibodies to spike protein uh, last quite long. Uh, uh, almost 465 days, um, um, and, and there you see the confidence intervals. Um, but it's important to say that other antibodies, for example, the antibodies to the nuclear protein, um, uh, last, last much shorter, about 60 days. And so it's important when you interpret how long antibodies are lasting to, be, to, to know which antibody is being tested for. And in all cases, actually, S antibody is the most sensitive and most specific and lasts the longest. Then, of course, um, there's the T cell response. And in this um, uh, recent paper in Science, um, these investigators looked at immune memory. So T cells and B cell immune me memory. If you've seen SARS-CoV-2 virus, how long that immune memory lasts. Um, and again, good news. Six to eight months after uh, people had COVID, there was still substantial immune memory, meaning that if 
the vi if, the, if, if, if you saw the virus again, you would respond with a robust immune response. So against this background, let's look at what we know about how effective vaccines are. And I think there's some key questions here. Firstly, does the vaccine reduce disease or symptomatic illness? Secondly, does the vaccine reduce severity of disease, hospitalization, mortality? And lastly, does the vaccine reduce transmission of virus? And, and so for this, we'd have to know whether the va vaccine is actually reducing asymptomatic infection um, or, or mild infection and, and potential transmission. And what has increasingly uh, emerged is for all these three questions, we have to ask, is the efficacy changed with viral variants? And so let me show you what we have. I'm going to turn to the Pfizer vaccine first. An amazing trial, phase three trial of over 44,000 pe uh, people, many countries, I think there were 57 countries included, including South Africa, four sites in South Africa. It's a placebo versus mRNA vaccine, given uh, two doses, three weeks apart. Well, it's uh, just um, uh, very impressive efficacy after two doses and 95% efficacy after one dose of 52% efficacy and actually um, uh, overall efficacy, only eight COVID cases um, in vaccinated versus 162 in the placebo uh, and only one severe case in the vaccine um, group. And actually what we know now um, from, from many countries that are rolling out this vaccine is in, that in fact, the efficacy is probably much higher um, after the first dose, so approaching 70% after the first dose. And here you see the results from their publication. Um, importantly, also to say that about 50% uh, of, of, of participants in the study had one comorbidity. There were a small number who had HIV. That was obviously from the, the um, uh, South African site and a very high proportion, 40% were over uh, 55 years. And here you see um, the, um, uh, the cumulative incidence of, of, of COVID in uh, vaccinated in, in red and placebo groups. And you can see at day 11, 12, a clear divergence. The vaccine starts to be highly protective at around day 11, 12, and, 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 and just complete um, divergence. And so, um, and there you see uh, the vaccine efficacy uh, of around 95% seven days after um, uh, uh, dose, um, after the second dose. Now there's been a, a question mark about are these vaccines effective against viral, against the variant strains? And so the first um, piece of information, which is good news also, is um, this um, from the Moderna group showing that there was a reduction in neutralizing antibodies, a three to five fold, five fold reduction um, for the mutant virus. So, but there was still substantial antibody reactivity. And I also want to remind you, and that's why I spent a, a moment on, the, on, on what drives immunity, is that it's not only um, antibodies to SARS. Um, uh, to, to the spike protein, there are other antibodies and the cell mediated immunity, which is probably extremely important here. And in fact, if you look at the responses in uh, 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 following vaccination, the cell mediated immune responses go up first um, and then the other anti and then antibody responses kick in. And importantly, I think on these platforms is that this vaccine can actually relatively be easily modified to reflect circulating virus type by changing the mRNA. Uh, and it, it's a quick production, which is why um, this vaccine is, 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 is being rolled out in, in, in millions of doses around the world. Very, very good news, I think. Um, this is from yesterday in Nature. Um, and, and this was a study in which they took um, uh, uh, 20 participants who had received the two doses of the Pfizer vaccine and they looked at the antibodies in these participants and tested how effectively they neutralized the wild virus and the three mutant viruses, one from the UK, one from South Africa. And the bottom line is there was effective neutralization of all viruses. Here you can see there was a slight decrease um, against the South African variant, small, 0.812, almost one and a half fold change 
this is very good news. This suggests that this vaccine is going to be effective against the mutant virus that we have in South Africa. Let me turn now to the AstraZeneca vaccine. And uh, this is the data from the phase two, three interim analysis, just almost 11,000 people. Importantly, the South African data was not included in this publication in terms of efficacy. It was only UK and Brazil data. Uh, two doses given four weeks apart. Uh, and as I said, it's an adenovirus vaccine, a chimp adenovirus. And um, importantly, to state different to the Pfizer vaccine, most participants were under 55 years and very few had comorbidities. Now, there was a little bit of a, a what should I say, um, an odd um, uh, mix up in this trial. And some uh, participants in the UK got standard dose, standard dose. And some participants for the first dose got low dose, standard dose, because there was a manufacturing um, error. And actually, the efficacy for these two um, approaches is very different. And I'll show you that just now. The overall efficacy was 70% for two doses. And importantly, there was a very big reduction in severe COVID. And here's the, 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 um, the data. Uh, and you can see a few uh, participants with comorbidities, most under 55. And um, just if you bear with me here, this is the overall efficacy of the vaccine, 70%. But look at this, if you look at the standard dose, standard dose, it's 60%. And if you look at the low dose, standard dose, it's 90%. Now, um, uh, I'll show you some, uh, there's another explanation for this, but, but, but I'll show you that on the next slide. But I also want to point out that this vaccine did not seem to protect against asymptomatic disease. So if you look here at the protective efficacy for asymptomatic disease, it's around 3.8%, 4%, which means that it's unlikely to protect against mild disease and unlikely to protect against transmission. Bear in mind that the, these, this trial reflects data of the usual virus, not the mutant virus, it's UK and um, uh, Brazilian data, as I said. Now, this is a further follow up to this paper, to that paper, and in fact, it's only in a preprint. Um, um, uh, so it's, a, it's an analysis and it's slightly more participants because it now includes the phase one, two data from South Africa. Uh, and and um, it's, it's also a longer period of time. It includes um, people who were in the trial up to the 7th of December. And here, um, uh, the, the reported efficacy is 76%. But what I think is important in this finding is that it's not actually so much the low dose um, standard dose that explains um, the higher efficacy, but it's actually the longer period between the first and second dose. Because if you look at the standard dose, standard dose, if the second dose was given under six weeks from the first dose, there was only 55% efficacy. But if it was longer, it gives you an efficacy of 82%. Now, the big question, how effective is the AstraZeneca vaccine against the variant viral strains? So again, a preprint from the um, Oxford group uh, showing that there was a ninefold, ninefold reduction in neutralizing antibodies for the UK strain, much, much bigger reduction than I showed you for the Pfizer. Um, but they report efficacy in their trial, 75% efficacy um, versus 84%. And they also found that the viral load was reduced and the duration of viral shedding lower. But this does not include the South African data. So we all heard the headline news from Shabir um, on Sunday. And, and this is a summary of the data. This is the phase one, two um, trial in South Africa. Uh, it involves almost uh, 1,800 HIV negative people. But look at this. This is the age distribution of people. The median age is 31 years. These are not people at high risk for severe disease and very much fewer having comorbidity and of these um, mostly ob obesity um, as a comorbid condition. Same dosing regime. And um, initially the efficacy was reported as 75% up to the 31st of October. 
following the 31st of October when the variant was, was predominating, we heard the efficacy of only 22%, and you can see the confidence intervals there, minus 49 to 60. Um, and, and the reason this is for mild or moderate COVID is because that this is what could be assessed in this in this trial. If you have a trial of, of people who are 31 years of age with relatively few comorbid conditions, you're not going to end. It's only uh, sort of a 1,800 person study and it's all HIV negative people, you're not really going to be able to assess the impact of this vaccine for severe disease. But what it does show is that in fact, this vaccine is not going to protect for mild or moderate COVID due to the South African variant. And I think this is a worry in healthcare workers because we also need to keep healthcare workers free from mild or moderate disease. Uh, the aim of vaccinating healthcare workers is to ensure that they are safe and healthy and that they're also not a source of transmission. And so the whole question about whether this vaccine can be used currently, I think, is, is under discussion. And as you know, it's on hold. And I think that's a correct decision uh, based on this data. We desperately need to know if the vaccine is protective against severe disease from uh, the variant, but I do not think uh, we are going to be able to get that data from this trial. I want to briefly speak about uh, the Sputnik vaccine, which I told you um, was highly effective. This is the Russian vaccine, uh, recently published in The Lancet, uh, done in 25 health facilities in Moscow, 25% of patients had comorbidity, 35% were older than 50 years, also two doses, three weeks apart, two different um, adenoviruses. And you can see uh, the efficacy, overall efficacy, 92%, really excellent efficacy. And um, the efficacy after the first dose, 73%, around 88% um, uh, percent, uh, as, as time goes, uh, 14 days after the first dose, and 100% protection for uh, moderate or severe disease. So this looks like a, a really promising vaccine. I understand that AstraZeneca and this Russian group are now working together to try and improve uh, or try and change uh, the AstraZeneca new trial. And here you see similar to the Pfizer vaccine, this is, this is for the Sputnik vaccine though, um, that if you look at the number of COVID cases in placebo groups versus vaccinated groups, you start to see a divergence early, 16 to 18 days after vaccination, which explains why there's really high protective efficacy um, after the first dose of vaccine. What about the Novavax vaccine? And all we have from Novavax is a headline press release. Um, and, uh, you know, I would uh, urge you to read these press releases um, very, very um, carefully um, be uh, because um, they can be misleading. So, so you can see in the South African trial, uh, uh, which was around 4,400 patients, and these patients, uh, participants, sorry, not patients, and these were largely um, through the um, uh, mutant virus period, September 2020 to January. Um, and the finding was a 60% efficacy in HIV negative participants. But again, be very careful how you interpret this efficacy because look at the confidence intervals. 20 to 80. Now WHO has, has given very clear guidelines as to what constitutes a vaccine that can be widely used. And they've said that you need a minimum efficacy of 50%, but that the lower bound of, of efficacy must be 30%. So this does not meet WHO requirements. And if you add in the results from HIV infected participants, efficacy drops to 49% with very wide confidence interval of six to 73%. So um, again, this doesn't look uh, promising for protection in South Africa. Um, most COVID was due to the variant strain. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the vaccine was protective against severe disease, uh, but I don't think this is um, sufficient um, efficacy to allow widespread um, use in South Africa. The Johnson and Johnson vaccine, okay? And again, you would, uh, there is no published uh, phase three trial data, but these were the headlines. Um, 
And, and again, be careful how you interpret the he headlines. And then we heard these headlines repeated on, on Sunday night again. Vaccine candidate, 72% effective in the US and 66% effective at moderate to severe COVID. Well, what is the South African data? In fact, the South African data, if you look here, 57% in South Africa, lower, substantially lower than in the US. And we haven't seen the confidence intervals for this. So, so I can't comment on those. Um, I think that the trial though, um, did have a good representation in terms of comorbidity. 41% of participants had comorbid conditions around a third were over 60 years. So is a, a much more representative uh, study in terms of the um, people who we really need to protect. Uh, and most cases of COVID in South Africa were due to the variant strain. So it is promising that there was 57% efficacy. Um, uh, and, and I think what is more promising is that um, overall protection for severe disease um, or hospitalization is, is given as 85 or 88%. Again, I'm not sure if the South African results have been disaggregated from the rest or not. Uh, this is what we heard on, on on, on headlines on Sunday night, 67% efficacy for moderate or severe disease from day 14 in South Africa, 57% um, efficacy overall, and we heard 85% efficacy against severe disease. Um, and I, 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 I think this was against the, um, this was the South African results, but I'm not sure. I haven't seen results um, for, for, for separate uh, sites. Uh, US, Latin America, and South Africa. So promising, but we really need to see more details of, of this data and we need to see confidence intervals and we need to see uh, the South African results um, compared to others. So let me try and summarize in terms of the clinical efficacy of the different vaccines. Uh, for clinical disease, for severe COVID, for clinical disease due to the variant virus and for severe disease due to the variant Pfizer. So Pfizer and Moderna, both very high efficacy for clinical disease and severe COVID um, for uh, preceding the variants. We don't know about the efficacy against the variants for clinical outcomes, but the lab data is strongly suggestive of, of uh, high protection um, and, and I think is convincing. The AstraZeneca vaccine prior to, to, to uh, the mutants arising, 67% for clinical disease and very good protection for severe COVID, but unfortunately uh, only 22% uh, protection for clinical disease, but this is mild or moderate disease. We do not know what the protective efficacy for severe disease is. Novavax, we have a reported uh, efficacy of 49%. Again, this is mild to moderate. Uh, uh, and some severe disease, uh, but this is just a headline result. We haven't seen a publication. And similarly, J and J, we have a headline of 57% protection um, in in the variant against clinical disease from the variant, and 85% for the severe disease. But we need to see uh, the the uh, results in more detail. Um, so now, what are the side effects of vaccines? And I think um, the major side effect is pain at the injection site, which you can expect in 70 to 80% of, of people, um, but only um, very few have a severe um, reaction at the injection site. And then systemic side effects are usually seen in the first one to take two days after vaccination. They're largely fatigue, headache, and fever. Uh, interestingly, in the Pfizer vaccine, there were fewer side effects in older adults. Um, and across um, all um, the studies, I think it's fair to say that there's been no increase in severe side effects in vaccinated compared to placebo groups. Uh, this is the information uh, uh, for the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, firstly, a local events um, uh, broken down by um, do uh, the first dose and the second dose, and then uh, under 55 years and over 55 years. And you'll see that um, local events are largely regarded as mild um, in green, with, with some moderate um, uh, in blue across age groups and across doses. And then if you look at systemic side effects, and here this is reported for fever, fatigue, headache, chills, vomiting, diarrhea, muscle pain, joint 
pain, you see again this, this pattern of green bars suggesting that they're mild, a few moderate events. Um, and uh, this is both for dose one and for dose two. And you can see that the bars are lower for, for those who are aged 55, suggesting less, less uh, uh, systemic events uh, or side effects in, in those who are older. Um, similar report for the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, pain at the injection site in 70 to 80% of participants and the same sort of pattern for, uh, for um, systemic side effects. Important to say that these were actually reduced with prophylactic paracetamol. So you could take paracetamol before or immediately after you get your, your, your vaccine. Um, and this did not interfere with immune responses. A big question is about what about pregnant women? Is the vaccine safe and is it effective? Uh, and I think uh, there isn't data on this yet. Um, I think it needs to be balanced against the knowledge that we have that SARS-CoV-2 infection in pregnancy is associated with preterm birth, with cesarean section, with fetal distress and with admission to a neonatal ICU. And we also know that although children have been largely spared in this pandemic, which has been the saving grace of, of the pandemic. The, the age groups in children that are most susceptible to severe disease are infants under one year of age and, and then adolescents, um, uh, late adolescents. And it's possible that vaccination of infants, uh, a vaccination of pregnant women, sorry, may protect infants um, in the early months of infancy. Uh, this is a strategy that is used, for example, for pertussis. Um, or for influenza and increasingly is being uh, tested for RSV. So there is a theoretical um, uh, possibility that vaccination of pregnant women may in fact protect infants and prevent these um, some of the associated um, uh, complications from COVID in pregnant women. Um, there is a Pfizer trial that is ongoing in pregnant women. And so the, uh, I think we will have uh, information on this uh, sometime uh, uh, in the, uh, this, well, certainly in the, um, this year, uh, it's a phase two trial of 350 women and, and a phase three trial of uh, three and a half thousand women. So we will get safety and, and efficacy data. But just to say that um, pregnant women have been vaccinated in trials, right? They're women who um, chose to, to be vaccinated or women at least who fell pregnant um, after they'd received vaccine. And also in countries where a vaccine has been rolled out, many, some pregnant healthcare workers, for example, have chosen to be vaccinated. Um, the, the jury is out and, and uh, you know, the, the um, general advice is that it's a risk benefit and that each pregnant women must make their own decision. I think for mRNA vaccines, it, uh, the vaccine is so safe and doesn't cross the, pl the placenta. Um, I think that uh, there's good reason to, to believe that it would be um, safe and, and effective, um, but there will be um, more data coming on from us. The other question that people ask me is, what if you've had COVID before? Or, or SARS-CoV infection? So firstly, just to say also in the headline Novavax, um, study, if you looked at uh, the participants who were in the placebo group, right, so they never got the Novavax uh, vaccine, and you looked at how many, in fact, were seropositive, in, in other words, had infection before they entered the trial, uh, and those who were seronegative before they entered the trial, and looked at whether there was a difference um, in, in the number of who developed COVID, because you'd think that perhaps if you'd had prior infection, you might be protected. But in fact, the, the attack rate was identical. So whether or not you'd had prior infection with SARS-CoV-2, you were still at risk. Uh, you had the same risk of getting um, disease. And this is from the mutant virus. Um, because remember, the Novavax study was done uh, through the period of when that virus was, uh, was the predominant uh, circulating virus. However, we do know um, uh, that, um, and there's no data on the severity of infection in these two groups. We, we know that second infections generally have been rare um, and they have been much milder than, than primary infections. 
um, and we'll wait to see um, if there's a difference in the clinical um, disease between these two groups. What we do know is that antibody levels after two doses of, for example, the Pfizer vaccine are much higher than levels of people who've actually had COVID. And so that's a reason to get vaccinated. You want as high protective antibodies. But also this recent, very recent, and it's a preprint uh, just posted on the 1st of February um, of, of uh, the mRNA vaccine showing that one dose may in fact be sufficient if you've had um, uh, uh, COVID before. So here you see, uh, this is before the uh, vaccine. These are people who've never had COVID before. And in, in uh, orange are people who've had COVID as measured by antibodies uh, to spike protein. And then they're given the vaccine. And you can see that those in orange mount a huge response at five to eight days. Um, and, and that is sustained uh, uh, for uh, you know, after uh, for up to 24 do uh, days from a single dose, whereas those that have never had COVID, um, the response is, is is much slower, and they get up uh, the level that those who have two doses, um, who've never seen um, uh, infection before, uh, is is lower than the the actual um, uh, response from a single dose in people who've, who've seen virus before. So I think um, the message here is that you've, uh, it, 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 giving people who've had COVID a single dose, certainly for an mRNA vaccine is, is more than adequate, is actually an excellent booster. Um, and and uh, in the interest of saving vaccine, that should probably be a, a strategy because your levels of protection are huge. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to interrupt you. I'm just worried about the time. Um, okay, I've, I've got yeah. about uh, a very few more slides, uh, so I'll wrap up That's quickly. Discussion. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so just to say that if you have seen um, uh, uh, COVID, if, you, if you've been infected with COVID before and you get vaccinated, you, do, you will get more, um, more um, local and systemic um, reactions. The other uh, considerations are, of course, cost and the delivery system. Uh, and, and we know that one problem with Pfizer is the, the, the requirement for minus 70 freezer. However, the vaccine can remain in refrigerators stable for five days. And Pfizer are working on a different formulation that doesn't require such um, extreme um, uh, uh, freezing. So why should I get vaccinated? I think there's individual benefit to protect yourself against COVID, reduce your chances of getting severe disease and reduce the stress and anxiety in, about working in environments where you have high exposure, potential exposure to COVID. There's a public health benefit to protect those around you and your household members and an economic benefit to, because if we can develop herd immunity, we can return to normal living, schooling, an economy that's opened and travel. Um, and I'll just end with perhaps some key messages. I think vaccination is safe and effective, particularly against severe disease. There is a lower efficacy for the variants, but it's likely that there's good protection for severe disease. Uh, in our context, the Pfizer vaccine is probably a, a good um, uh, option against the mutant variant. And we need to see the data on the J&J &J vaccine, but that is also um, looks promising from the headlines. Uh, we need rapid vaccination of healthcare workers followed by vulnerable groups. Uh, and just to stress that we still need to, to continue masking, social distancing, hand hygiene um, to control transmission. I think vaccine is key to protect you and your loved ones and to allow us to get back to normal living. And if we look at the global rollout of vaccines, it's really a terrible, I think, and, and distressing situation that as you can see, there's there's almost no rollout in Africa, uh, despite more than 100 million doses ha already having been administered worldwide. And actually, the projections are, again, that Africa will only have a widely available vaccine largely in 2022 and even into 2023. I think this is appalling, and I think we need to act urgently uh, to correct this. We posted this letter of appeal to the Department of Health on the 1st of uh, January saying we as health care workers need vaccine now and urgently. It was signed by more than 10,000 people. 
We then saw AstraZeneca vaccine arriving, uh, but we've heard now that AstraZeneca vaccine is not suitable, but I think we must be urging our Department of Health to roll out uh, Pfizer vaccine, potentially J&J vaccine. Um, we need whatever vaccine we can get to protect all of us um, and particularly our healthcare workers at the, at the call front. That's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. There are a few thanks that people have put th through um, for a very useful talk. The qu one question which I think is on everyone's mind, Kate Mawson asks, uh, it seems like a terrible waste uh, not to use the AstraZeneca um, vaccine. I know the WHO has indicated that they still support it. What, do you, what, what, what would your advice be? Yeah, I think this is a difficult question. Um, as I said, the difficulty with AstraZeneca vaccine is when you want to use it for for healthcare workers, you do want to protect healthcare workers against mild or moderate disease. Um, otherwise, they're going to be a source of transmission in, 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 in their households and in healthcare institutions, and we need to protect our healthcare worker force. I think there may be uh, a role for AstraZeneca vaccine, perhaps not in healthcare workers, in other vulnerable groups. Um, and I think, you know, uh, uh, Shabir, for example, has said that it's probable that it does protect against severe disease. So uh, I think the jury's out on this and, and we, you know, ho ho hopefully here in the next week or so. Um, but I think for healthcare workers, we want a vaccine that has maximum efficacy. And if there's a better vaccine, uh, that should be targeted to healthcare workers. Um, can I just ask you a follow up um, while I'm looking for other questions? Uh, from people that are on, um, what is the messaging? Should what should the messaging be? Because my, I suppose my concern is um, that if we say AstraZeneca doesn't work, it will just kind of add to the confusion. Uh, I mean, it doesn't work only in a very specific pop, you know group, and and that's um, quite different. Uh, so how how do we, what 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 should we be doing? Good, a couple of people got their hands up. I'll go to you next. Yeah. I think the message is that AstraZeneca doesn't work for mild or moderate disease. As I said, it was tested in this young population who were HIV negative, didn't have comorbidities. This is not a population who actually one needs to protect. And I think what, what we really do want to do is protect people for uh, against severe disease largely. I think the message should be vaccines are largely protective, particularly against severe disease. Um, Unfortunately, you know, there isn't uh, data on the AstraZeneca vaccine and its protective efficacy for severe disease in the context of the mutant virus, but it's likely that it does protect if the antibody levels, for example, that you get from AstraZeneca vaccine in South Africa are very similar to the antibodies that you get from the J&J &J vaccine. Um, so I, I think the, the overall message, vaccines are important, they're safe, and they're likely to protect, the, even the AstraZeneca is likely to protect against severe disease. Um, and, and uh, you know, this is, this is the, the, the primary thing that we need to protect against, hospitalization, mortality, um, and, 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 you know, severe use of, of oxygen. And, sure. Uh, okay. Jackie, do you, uh, just Jackie or Petrus, either whichever gets there first, J Jackie? Hi. Hi, Heather. Thank you for an amazing oh. talk. Um, Heather, there was, there was talk about um, perhaps making the J&J &J vaccine available to frontline healthcare workers like soon. But yeah. it, isn't clear, it isn't clear to me whether that means that we are going to be part of a trial. I mean, that, that's not really clear. And then is it actually ethical? If it is that we become part of a trial, is it ethical for it to be placebo controlled in a, in a, you know, in a bunch of frontline healthcare workers? And my final question would be, would you, if you're working on the frontline, take the J&J &J vaccine? Thanks, Jackie. Those are really important questions. So firstly, to say, um, it's not a placebo uh, trial that is being proposed, as I understand. It's an implementation trial. Everyone gets J&J &J vaccine and then they're followed for the development or protection against COVID um, from the mutant strain in South Africa. Um, I, I think this is problematic in, in terms of a rollout. You cannot 
have a trial and a rollout is it's accessible to everyone. A trial is a different thing. It requires informed consent. It's at specific sites. It recall, uh, you know. So I think firstly we need to see the data on J and J. Secondly, we need SAPRA approval for the J and J vaccine, which hasn't been granted yet. Thirdly, you know, if it's a trial, then it must be done under trial conditions. Um, so you, you know, I, I think that what is uh, and, and, and also, as, as you heard, it's being proposed at very specific sites where the J&J um, trial was originally done in South Africa, and that's not widespread access for healthcare workers. Um, so I think, uh, you know, this is problematic in some ways, and um, I think uh, we need more clarity on this, and we need to see the data, and we first need SAPRA approval. Um, would I take the J&J vaccine? I probably would, but I would very much like to see the data first. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Petrus. Hello, Heather. I, I kind of wrote my question to you in the, in the chat box, but I can just ask it again. I was very interested to see that AstraZeneca showed very differential responses when the dose gap between dose one and two was four weeks versus 12 weeks. Right. Um, that you presented. And so it was very interesting to me that the VITS data were based on a four week treatment gap. Would it not be a logical thing for VITS to do or somebody to do a study looking at a 12 week gap of the AstraZeneca um, virus in a South African variant? Um, I, what, what I'm worried about is that the AstraZeneca vaccine will now be seen as a bad vaccine in a South African context when in fact, you know, we know viruses mutate and we might just need to be smarter than the virus itself. Yes, again, uh, Petrus, I think that's an important question. I think the problem is that you, you can't have long periods of time when in fact there's no efficacy for protection. So yes, the efficacy in the AstraZeneca vaccine went up with longer protection, but there was protective efficacy, you know, even in the first uh, four weeks. Um, you know, what, what Shabir is showing with, with the AstraZeneca vaccine is in fact, there's no protective efficacy at all. Um, in, in, in these first four weeks um, or, or following the second dose. So um, you know, I think it's hard to, 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 to implement a vaccine that is not going to protect you at all for the first 12 weeks, three months, and then you know, perhaps get some protection uh, with a second dose. Um, you know, the, the, the UK has gone the route of prolonging, uh, as you know, the prolonging the second dose to a 12 week period, but that's be for the public health good. So you vaccinate more people with dose one and then extend the period. But, but for all the vaccines that they're using, they've shown reasonable protective efficacy with the first dose, whether it's Pfizer or, or AstraZeneca um, within the first weeks. Um, here, there's a, there's a question in the chat box uh, from Helen Smith. Uh, uh, the AstraZeneca and Sputnik collaboration, yes. Um, uh, well, no, so, uh, we, we, we haven't seen the data on Sputnik against the South African variants because it, Sputnik was only done in Russia, 25 Russian sites, but the efficacy looks much higher than the efficacy, for example, of AstraZeneca vaccine that was originally reported in, in the UK um, and Brazil. So it may, it may very well be a promising strategy, um, particularly if, if the J&J &J results are, are true, that a single dose of, of, of uh, this adenovirus, and it uses the same adenovirus initially as the J&J &J, um, uh, vaccine. So I think it's, it, it's promising and, and we'll have to see where AstraZeneca and, and the Russians go with this. It's a new trial, it's called Sputnik Light. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure pretty soon we'll see this kind of data that we've seen from Pfizer in terms of looking at the antibodies of people who have been vaccinated and whether those are um, at least neutralize uh, the mutant virus or not. Okay, um, there's a question about being infected after vaccination. Uh, will I still be a source of transmission? I think I think the answer is yes. So unless I'm wrong about that, I'm going to ask the one last question, uh, which is from uh, I forget who it was from uh, Vanessa Cross, who says, uh, "Why did South Africa not opt for the Pfizer vaccine?" And I'll add to her point that, um, and I know the answers are on the fridges, but um, you know the cost of a fridge uh, is really nothing compared to the cost of. Uh, associated with people getting sick. 
this is it seems like this is a very strong vaccine uh why, why don't why don't we have more of it and why don't we have more of it yesterday yeah, so that's, I think that's a really important question. And we hear that, Pfizer, that there are 20 million doses of Pfizer vaccine that's supposed to come. Uh, I can't answer as to why the Department of Health hasn't got these in hand right now. There is the issue of ultra low freezers, minus 70, but there is capacity around the country, certainly in academic institutions, to provide those and to support those. And as I said, the vaccine can actually be out of a fridge for five days. Um, also, um, uh, um, um, you know, so, so, so I think, uh, yes, I think now we really need very wide advocacy for, for, for getting the Pfizer vaccine, particularly since we have this data showing that the antibodies effectively neutralize uh, the, the mutant strain. I mean, the, 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 uh, the pushback has been around rural areas, around difficult to reach healthcare workers and so on, um, and, and, and that's valid. But I think we need to protect whoever we can with this vaccine. Um, and, and yes, it is more expensive also than the AstraZeneca or the uh, J&J, but cost is a moving target. And, and as, as Dan correctly say, the cost of hospitalization, the cost of mortality is, is, is huge. So um, I, I would strongly urge that we um, urge that this, this vaccine be made available. Um, I think Petrus has also made a very important point that we're going to see changes in vaccine. So like we have with the flu vaccine, we have a different variant each year um, and, and a different immunization. It's highly likely that we're going to get booster doses for, for COVID that are adapted for the variants. And, and again, the mRNA technology is very well suited for this. So, so um, uh, it's not a one-stop uh, thing that you know vaccination now is gonna protect you down forever. Um, we, we're going to have rolling vaccination and, and, uh, and, and different vaccines needed. Great. Yes, so, it's all shot for Pfizer now. Great. So thanks very much. Heather. There are a lot of uh, comments saying thank you for a very clear presentation. So just to thank you on behalf of the department. I mean, my sense, uh, you know, is there's a lot of vaccine hesitancy. And particularly after this last few days, there's a lot of concern that we don't know what we're doing. And, and my thought is we should have a much more positive message, which is that, uh, which I think you've concluded with, which is that vaccines work um, and we should have them as soon as possible. Thanks very much. Thanks to everyone for being here. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye.